are live coming in on Tuesday night. We're going to discuss week three. We got Anthony Miller in the house. How's it going, Anthony? It's great to be back on the show, Matt. It's a uh... It feels like forever. I mean, we were on the, I was on the show last year with you and I think we were talking about how uh, Arlington is struggling and uh, we're going to have the same conversation again, I guess this year. (laughs) I'm glad we got the guy, the Arlington guy. You're definitely going to be able to break it down for us. Uh, You were at the game last week, correct? I was. Yes, I was. How was that experience? I haven't been there this season yet. Uh, you know, the first game was really good. It was a very good atmosphere. I think it was the best crowd that uh, I think they've had since 2020. So that first game with Birmingham, there was a lot of energy to it. I think there's a lot of excitement, a lot of, of the unknown on, you know, what, what are we going to see with the team and with the, the new UFL, but it was, uh, that was a great experience. Um, obviously last week, we'd like to see no, a little more people come into the to the game, but um, still really good energy from the crowd that was there. The I think it was like eighty four hundred that ended up being there. there. There was still good energy to it, and I mean the the people did come out came out to probably one of the best games of the season. Yeah, yeah, it was a good. And you really got to see Arlington kind of click on as an offense, in my opinion. They really haven't opened it up like they did week three. I mean, I felt like they could go toe to toe with with whoever during that portion. Yeah, that was their best offensive performance probably since the playoffs last year. No that doubt. was the mo- that that was the most complete performance from the offense, and uh, that's what makes that loss so disappointing. Was that Luis Perez probably had one of his best games since he's been in spring football. Tyler Vaughn's had a, a career day for him. He had his first 100 yard receiving day as a uh, professional football player. Uh, Devion Smith finally broke through, had a nice game, 63 yards on the ground. You know, Letty Brown ran the ball well. It's just overall that the offense played well. It was just unfortunately when they were called upon towards the end of the game to try to run up the clock and do what needs to be done. It, it, it didn't happen. They had that really bad drop on third down that um, resulted in, you know, D- DC getting the ball back and giving them plenty of time to, um, do you know, get, do, yeah, have that miraculous comeback with 10 points within or 11 points within 54 seconds. Yeah, let's talk about it a little bit more in just a second. I'm going to pull up some data and stuff. But in, in terms of you, man, you've had a lot of stuff going on since we talked last. You guys, the the whole structure of what I knew when we talked last has changed. Can you tell us more about that for people that aren't familiar? Uh, yeah. So currently I am working with fan nation sports illustrated. I'm covering the UFL and the CFL for them, as well as working for a college football network, uh, just basically calling, you know, covering college football. So, uh, you know, I, I felt like I didn't have enough on my plate, so I wanted to just go ahead and just pile on a couple more things on it. But, um, no, the, the, the experience has been great with, uh, sports illustrated. I mean, I, it's been a lifelong dream of mine. I used to have subscriptions to sports illustrated delivered to my house every week, except for the swimsuit edition. My parents always intercepted that one, but, um, <laughs> I had to get that I, one. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. But, um, I love sports illustrated it's been a lifelong dream and to, 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 to write for them and to, you know, to do what I love to be able to have the combination of working for sports illustrated as well as them buying into um, covering other football leagues like the UFL and CFL and seeing, you know, the kind of traffic that we can get with it. That, that's kind of the awesome thing is how much spring football is growing here in America and how much American interest there is in the Canadian football league as well. So it's really going to make, you know, not only covering the UFL has been awesome this year with them, but I'm really excited about when the CFL kicks off in June and we're able to get that season rocking and rolling. So um, yeah, it's, it's been a wonderful experience working with sports illustrated, you know, college football network I've been writing for since I think I joined like last August and covering the college football season with them has been awesome and been really busy lately working on transfer portal stuff. So um, yeah, just, uh, just keeping myself busy here. Yeah. You're very busy, man. I see stuff from CFL, UFL college. I see a lot of different things coming out your way. And it's all solid work. So, I mean, it's good stuff, man. Seriously. I Thank you. I appreciate that. It's, I've seen articles from you before. I, I asked you, like, hey, are you covering this team now? And you're like, no, I'm just, just writing it up, telling you what's going on. I'm like, well, I can respect that 100%. I, I'm, I mean, I love what you guys are doing. I mean, the, bringing the Alternative Football Network brand, the, the way you guys have grown it over, what do you say, that less than a year? You guys yeah, are man. 
doing that. I mean, that that's that's awesome to see. Uh, I appreciate. I love that. seeing. Absolutely, I love seeing the work you guys are doing and giving the the you know these alternative football leagues um, the proper coverage they need. I think it's awesome. Yes, sir. Definitely trying. My my goal was with this first year to not spread myself too thin. So really trying to hone in on the UFL, but. <clears throat> Once CFL comes around, definitely hoping to do some coverage on that as close as possible as I can because, I mean, I've never followed that league even as a fan, so it'll be a whole new experience for me as well. I'm pretty excited about that, though. Uh, yeah, you'll love it. It's, it's a different brand of football, but it's, I would say, probably a little more fast-paced and a different type of strategy to it, so it's, it's, it's an awesome experience watching CFL, yeah, yeah. so I think you'll enjoy it. No doubt. Even the rules. I mean, learning the new rules, I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that's yep. pretty neat. I want to see it in action now, so... Hopefully, yep. my goal is to try to make it to Canada to see a game. I don't know how how that'll happen, but we'll see how it all works out. Yeah, I'm gonna try to go to the Grey Cup this year and cover it for Sports Illustrated. So we'll we'll see if my schedule lines up for that. Yeah, that's a pretty big event, right? I mean, how many people do you think are there for for the Grey Cup typically? Oh, I'm trying to think. I think last year I just wrote an article on it, but I think they had like. For the whole, it's a whole, it's a whole week. Like it's not just the game. Like they have events going on during the week, and I think last year in Hamilton, um, they I think had like four hundred thousand plus or something. It was like one of the biggest Canadian events of the year. So, um, yeah, it's it's you know not not only do you have the game, but you know they had Green Day come out and perform. I think Carrie Underwood performed as well there. Like they they they've they've gotten some really good talent to come out for the Grey Cup. It's really become an experience. I mean they've. They've it, they've had the great cups for over a hundred plus years. So wow. I mean, it's, you know, so it's you know, while it's you know, hockey is still ruling supreme in Canada, like there's still some very you know, Canada's very loyal to the CFL, and I think that's why we really haven't seen NFL expansion. Like I, you know, I think we were have been anticipating is going to happen. It's because Canada is just so loyal to the CFL. Yeah, yeah, you can you can see it, and like the the guys that I have, the CFC, the Canadian Football Countdown. They're mm -hmm. in with the network, and I've had a lot of discussions with them, watch their shows, so that's kind of how I've got involved a little bit because they're doing the yep. work for me. I'm just having to go listen for the info now, so it's pretty cool. Yep. Yep. But, Anthony, it, it's great to have you, man. I appreciate you. Uh, lots of changes y'all's way, but, man, it, it's good to see your thing, the, the Fan Nation, Sports Illustrated. It's good to see it all still being a success. You guys have done a good job getting your name out there as well spreading that brand awareness. I know I've seen your social media following go up a lot, you know, over what a few months. So I think you guys are I, all doing a fabulous yeah. job. I appreciate it. I will say having Mike Mitchell on, I mean, that, that dude is a legend. I mean, he's, no doubt. he, he's, he's a big reason why I joined fan nation sports illustrated. He had recommended me to Art Garcia who brought me in. So I, I mean, I've been, um, you know, I've been writing Mike's coat uh, coattail for since 2019, and he's a big reason why, like, I'm the writer that I am and that I do the type of coverage I do. So I owe a lot to him. And then obviously, Art Garcia, who's the main editor and the, the he runs the site for, you know, the UFL and the CFL. So anyway, I, I appreciate them for bringing me on. And that, that's why I put in the type of work I do, because when, when you have people like that, that believe in you and having a mentor like Mike, you know, it makes me want to, you know, work my tail off every day to get on their level and give the the type of coverage in that these leagues deserve. Yes, sir. I'm right there with you, man. And I, I can't imagine working with them in the same capacity. So it, it's got to be an honor. And I know you, you got to amp your work up a little bit working with these type of guys as well. You got to. It's a whole nother level. No, I mean, especially, I mean, Mike's been covering spring football for 20 plus years. I mean, he was with the XFL back in 2001, covering that league um, for um, XFL board. That's now UFL board and, you know, arts covering, you know, the Texas Rangers as well. Like these are guys that have been in the front line. So for someone like me, that's, you know, I, I've been in broadcasting, you know, whether it's news or sports since 2016, I, but I've only been involved in the sports side since 2019. Like, I've kind of had to work my way up and I, I look up to guys like that, that, you know, have been in it, they're established and, you know, just still trying to reach their level. But I know, I know with the uh, Mike's in his own, his, he's got his own pedestal. Like I'm never going to reach that one, but you know, as long as I can, you know, be there to uh, be there for the ride, uh, that that's, that's good enough for me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm right there with you. I'm hoping to get him on again soon on the show, but I know, man, it's just like, <clears throat> I've had you guys on. I've had you on what two times last year, 
think I had him on yeah. four times. I try not to bug y'all. I really want you, you know, I want it to be like, just, Hey, you want to come on? I don't want it to be like, Hey, every week, Hey, come on my show, come on my show. So appreciate the time. I'm, oh yeah. I'm, I mean, you, you can call me anytime, man. I'll, I'll I definitely will, man. Cause that's a, there's, there's points and there's times where like, it's like, I would like to do a pop-up show, maybe 20 minute long discussion, but it's just, it's, it's a lot of planning involved, a lot of things going. So it doesn't ever happen, you know? So all that yeah. stuff would be awesome. Life happens. So. Mm -hmm. I always say real life comes first. That's my motto. Yep. Yep. But anyway, man, let's get on to some game breakdowns. Uh, I've got Brady Ray sitting in the, the background waiting on his breakdown of uh, Memphis showboats at the uh, Birmingham stallions. Uh, we'll have a couple more contributors coming on discussing the other games as well. Still waiting for them to pop in, though, so we'll see what happens. Um, but, Anthony, it's good to have you. Uh, just wanted to see if you would like to break down this D.C. Defenders game. Tell us more about it since you're on the front lines. I mean, D.C. Defenders took it home 29-28 to 28 against the Arlington Renegades. Tough fight. It was... A lot of a, a lot of mixed emotions on this one. I mean, this was a great game. I mean, it was once again uh, second straight week we saw a team be able to convert the fourth and twelve onside and basically come from score double digit points within a minute to win a game. So, I mean, major kudos to, to DC because you know offensively, I don't think they particularly had a great game. I mean, they they struggled running the football. I I, I didn't feel like. Jordan Te'amu, I thought, had one of his weakest games. I just don't think he was very accurate with the football. I mean, Arlington did a good job of getting pressure on him at moments, but um, he, he just didn't really seem like himself. It was it was a very odd experience to see how he played. And, but it was frustrating, too, because I think Arlington had one of their best offensive performances that I've seen in you know since I've been covering this team in 2020. I mean, Luis Perez had a great game, almost 300 yards passing, two touchdowns. I think there were a lot of moments too that I think Luis Perez, you know, missed on throws. Um I I, I think it continues to be a problem that, you know, he doesn't have the strongest arm, so I, he missed a couple of deep balls that he could have converted on for big yards or a touchdown. Um he probably had at least two to three passes that probably should have been intercepted by CC. So I do think he got lucky at moments in this game, but I thought overall he played really well. Um, I, like I said earlier, Tyler Vaughn's had a great game for him that it was his best professional performance of his career over a hundred yards uh, receiving on nine catches and a touchdown. He performed really well. Um, the running game, you know, I think Letty Brown needs to get more carries because I, I, he he brings a different dynamic to that offense from Devion Smith. Devion Smith's the type of guy like I always say this like he's a guaranteed two to three yards a carry because he's just he's gonna pound it in the middle of the hole. He is going to get those tough yards that maybe most backs won't get. But Letty Brown could do a lot when it comes down to catching the ball on the you know on swing passes, screen passes. He's got a little more speed than Devion Smith had, but. You know, big credit to Devion Smith for having his best game of the season, 63 yards rushing for him. So I thought he performed really well. Like overall, offensively, this is a team that had over 400 yards of offense. DC had under 300 yards of offense, and somehow DC came out and won. And I, I really think the big reason for that is uh, one, Arlington penalties. I mean, penalties are going to kill you every time. I think they had like 75 yards of penalties, of penalty yards. And, I, and they and they had penalties at really bad moments, like late in the first half, late in the second half. They had key penalties that knocked them either knock you know knocked them out of field goal range late in the first half. They could have had points there. They weren't able to convert on it. They had a penalty that set them up with a field goal late in the you know in the in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, the, there was you know on that last drive with DC, they had the I think the roughing the passing penalty on Jordan Tiamu, and then they had. Um, Deron Lowe had an interception go right through his hands and into the hands of the DC defenders. They end up getting a big, I think like a 15, 20 yard gain on a pass. So there was a lot of mental mistakes and, and that, that falls on the defense. I, I think this defense has, has not played as well as they did last year. Defense was a strength to this team. I really do think this year it's become the weakness. It's kind of flip flop where okay. I think the offense is playing really well, but the defense is, is not been at the level they are. I think it, a lot of it has to do with the secondary. I think not having Will Hill there, not having Joe Powell there. I, I, I think those those guys, not having those guys have been a big loss for them because you're, you're starting to notice in the secondary, they, they don't press up. They're not really as aggressive 
as you would like to see from those, or they can be sometimes too aggressive and completely yeah. whip on plays. So, you know, I would love to see the secondary play a lot better. I like to see the defense, you know, be more consistent, but I will say overall, like th- this is so tough because, you know, coach Stoops every week in the press conference is always talking about this team looks better than how they are. Like they, they truly are better than their record. Like I know they're Oh, and three, but I think they can take Memphis. I think they can take, I think they can take most of the USFL teams outside of Birmingham. Like I, I really do think this team is still the fo- the fifth or you know, probably the fifth or sixth best team in this league. It's just, unfortunately they had a juggernaut of a beginning of the year playing the Birmingham Stallions, playing the St. Louis Battlehawks and playing the DC defenders. They just had really bad luck with it. Luckily they're getting into the easier part of their schedule now. Like, Honestly, if they lose to Houston this weekend, you can go ahead and wrap it and call it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, like, that's a like, long there's, season. There, there's no way they should lose to the Roughnecks. Like no. they're they're overall offense, defensive, special teams just way more talented than they are. But I mean, it's kind of a weird feeling because I, I feel like at zero and three, I still feel like Arlington has a chance to make the playoffs. Like this yeah. is still a really good football team. I still think overall they have the talent to do it. And Coach Juice has always been saying that the press conferences, like, you know, statistically, we're a really good team. We're just not they're just not closing out games. And that's the most frustrating part. They didn't close out against St. Louis and they didn't close out last week against DC. If they could just figure out how to close games and win it, then I then that's gonna solve their problems. But they they have to be more disciplined. I mean, they they cannot make the the mistakes that they are making. They make a lot of critical penalties at the end of games that's hurting them. So if they can clean up on the penalties, be more disciplined, then I think this team will be in good shape. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you on that as well. And that defense, man, it was rough watching it. Tiamu just basically did what he wanted in terms of rushing. He led the defenders with 55 yards of rushing during that game. And, I mean, a lot of it was him scattered, in my opinion. I mean, he just took his legs and ran. So they get some of that cleaned up. And I don't know, man. It's like they played the Stallions. Imagine Martinez when the Stallions versus Arlington. That would have been a, a different game than, than Matt Corral. So I'm hoping we well, see you, some improvements on that D, man. Seriously. I mean, I mean, you bring up a great point. That's been that was their problem week one also against Birmingham, is yep. that if it wasn't for Adrian Martinez getting injured, he probably would have ran over a hundred yards on them because he already no had doubt. like I think he had like 40, 50 yards rushing before he left late in that first half with the ankle injury. Yep. So, I mean, him and Matt Corral were having their way. And that's a big problem is that they're not putting QB spies on these quarterbacks and they're letting them run all over the place. So that, that's a that's a good point. I, I wish, I, you know, they they defensively, they they have to be more strategic in how they're going about it. And, you know, uh, Reed Sinnott can run the ball too. So uh, they're going to need to make sure that they're keeping Reed Sinnott in the pocket because they, they've been letting these mobile quarterbacks run all over them and they, and they can't afford to do that because it is tearing them apart because they're, they have see this run right here. Like mm-hmm. there's no one there. There's no one in the middle. The linebackers are backed out in coverage. Like every time you do that, yeah, J- J- Jordan's going to take that run every single time because it's just wide open. Yeah, DeMarcus is one of our contributors. He said, I put that on coaching. The defense repeatedly shows that they're not situationally aware. And, I mean, I could see that as well. And you could see that from week one, week two. That and He hit real big on, a, on the piece he did, the middle of the field. We're not defending the middle of the field. We're not defending the middle. I mean, it's still the same thing. It's very, very, very similar as weeks one and two. Weeks one was worse, in my opinion. Which is very odd because Jay Hayes was the play caller last year for the defense. And he called really good games. I mean, there were so many games where last year we were like, where is the offense? Because the defense is carrying the load for this team. And it just yeah. feels like, and the big problem last year with the offense was Jonathan Hayes was not calling great games. Like the first half of the season, he wasn't really calling great games until Luis Perez came. And then all of a sudden he became a, he was calling really good games. And it's just kind of flip flop this year where it's like the defense is not really calling what they need to like, here late in the game, like they, they have corners that are backed up 10, 15 yards. Like you're giving, and there's Deron Lowe missing, you know, the interception, but they, they're giving them, they gave the receivers like 10, 15 yards of cushion with under a minute to go in the, in late in the game. Like you, you gotta, you know, you gotta press up a little bit more. You can't give them those easy yards underneath. And I, I think that's been really a main problem all season for this team, you know, through three weeks. Yeah. They won it on the fourth and twelve. I mean, that seconds left, D.C. pulled it off. 
And it has a lot of people questioning the fourth and 12 now as if it's too easy. And we had a question or comment from Van. Van said, should fourth and 15 be revisited during the off season? I mean, it was one for one last year in the XFL. It's been two for two this year. I, <laughs> I, I mean, it shouldn't be that easy. It's just if you look at all those fourth and 12 plays, you know, I will say last week with um, or two weeks ago when San Antonio converted the fourth and 12, they got right on that line. I mean, it was just exactly at 12 yards. So I think yeah. they got very lucky. They, they almost didn't get that. But I think the problem is. Is again, defenses are just giving too much room for the receivers to catch. They're too worried about getting blown over the top and for a big play when really they should be defending the 12 yards. Like the the, the corners have got to press up a little bit more, and you got to get you know some help from the safeties to cover that. So I I I think it's defenses need to adjust to a fourth and 12. I don't know if it's something they're they're practicing you know during the week, but I really think it is something they should be practicing is preparing for that fourth and 12, you know, they're going to pass the football. You know that they probably will go some with some kind of in route or slant route to try to hit that 12, 13 yards or the trip, you know, try to go to the sidelines for, you know, 12 to 15 yards. So you already know what you need to cover. You just need to be, you know, I just, I just think the defenses need to be more prepared for it. So I think it will get defenses moving forward, practicing a lot more during, you know, the week on being prepared for moments like that, but it, it's really on defensive play calling. Like they, they, they got to do better uh, secondary wise, but should they revisit it? Maybe. I mean, it may have to be 15, 20 yards before they can, you know, do it. But I, I feel like with 20 yards, you're almost, you, you don't want to make it impossible, but you're, you're heading into the range of, you know, onside kicks in the NFL are like less than 10% uh, being able to get in. I think we're getting, if you push it 20 yards or more, then you're getting to that point where you're you're not really making it realistic to make. Yeah, it. I mean, I I think it's exciting, and I, I don't I don't see the the wrong in it because it's it's fulfilled its purpose yet. Where we've seen teams that like San Antonio last week, they had the opportunity to do it and they chose not to. They chose to kick off instead there at the end of the game, and so people are using it adequately. It's not being used just willy nilly. Hey, fourth and twelve, let's go. Uh, that's why I think it, it's appropriate. Oh, I love it. I, I think it brings a different wrinkle to the game. And I, I think it does give um, the, you know, offenses a better chance of getting the ball back. I, I think it's, you know, will we ever see it in the NFL? I mean, it feels like they're really, ch- some teams are trying to push it, but it, you know, I, I feel like the NFL probably thinks that might be a little too gimmicky, but then again, they took the XFL kickoff, so they could <laughs> potentially do it in the, in the future. I think it does bring more excitement. It brings a different strategy to how you're closing yeah. out games. Because now you're you're making it that, that that's the great part about the UFL is that you can have a double digit lead and game's not over. Like for now, because uh, I was I was feeling too comfortable at the end of that DC Arlington game where I thought the game was over. No more. I will never ever go through a <laughs> UFL game where it's a 10, 12 point game and I think the game is over. I'm be like, nope, this can they can still change. San Antonio did that for me week two. Yeah, week two. They they changed my mind very quickly on the field as mm-hmm. I watched. So I, I'm right there with you, man. I feel like it's different than last year. Last year, watching these games, I could kind of call what was going on and, and envision what was happening. Now, we're just playing football, man. It's 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 on. Look, there's there's a gift and a curse to a merger. The, the, the curse is you're losing eight teams. The, the gift is you're getting teams that are very competitive. I mean, even you can say what you want about Houston. They still have really good players on that defense. And they still like Reed Senate still played really well. Like all the teams have talent. And I think that's what makes this league so great this year is that the talent level is, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I honestly think it's the best it has maybe ever been since the USFL back in the eighties. Like I, I really think this matches up to what the talent level was for the 2020 XFL season. Yeah. Like there, there, there are teams that are really good and really competitive from top to bottom. I know Houston and Arlington are winless, but they're still really good football teams that has the ability to win games. So I think that's what's making this season different than it has been in the past. And I think that's why, you know, the league is probably happy with what they've seen. And it, it's showing in the ratings that they're performing better because they're there's the, the on-field talent is better than it has been in a long time. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm enjoying it. And if people are actually watching these games, they got to be getting into it as well. Most of them have not been runaway wins. We've gone to the final seconds of every game almost. So that's why it, it, it's growing and it looks well. I mean, in terms of, of in person, how did that 8,411 people look in terms of attendance? I mean, I can't lie. At the beginning of the game, it didn't it didn't look great. I mean, oh, I saw it, it on TV. It, it, it did not look great. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. It it, uh, it took a little bit. I think as the game went on, like around the second quarter, I was like, okay, it's starting to look a little bit better. But at the beginning of that game, I was like, there, there's no way there's even five thousand fans here right now. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm really trying not to be critical, but it's like the, the eye test really shows that it, it just wasn't great. And it's very odd because I. Arlington is one of those places since 2020 where it's never been the highest attended games, but it's never been the lowest. It's yeah. always been right in the middle. It's always been like number four, number five. So to see them get under, it's the first time they've ever been under 10,000. They've never been under 10,000. Even the Friday night game where Taylor Swift was in town last year, they still were able to put 10, 11,000 people in the seats. So it's, it was surprising to see that, but you know, problem is the team is 0 and 3 and they're not winning games. So, uh, you know, they, they got to get back on track and, you know, pick up some wins. If they, if they can pick it up here late in the season, then they'll start getting more people to those games, especially their last home game of the year is against the St. Louis Battle Hawks. And I'm, I'm sure that's, you know, if, 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 you know, if playoff opportunities are on the line for Arlington, there's going to be a lot of fans at, the, at that game. And I think they can get back to hitting, you know, 12 to 15,000. Yes, sir. Now let's talk about the TV ratings real quick. 534,000 average TV viewers on ESPN. This was the lowest game viewed this week. Uh, maybe you can provide more of a context to this, but I mean, in terms of, of my opinions, I still think this is good. I don't think this is a bad sign, but that's me. Look, I think there's two lessons to this that I think the league hopefully can learn from. One, stop playing games at 11, 12 o'clock. It's too Please. early. Yep. Uh, it's, it, it's, I understand why they're doing it. They're trying not to compete with other sporting events and stuff like that. I totally get it. Put it's, it's okay to compete with others. I mean, that if, you know, Sunday showed anything is that you can put games up on ABC and still be very competitive, you know, towards the masters and stuff like that and still get over a million viewers. Like you can, you can still compete. No, you're not. You're, I think the reality of the situation is this is a league that's, you know, they probably want to hit two, 3 million. They're not going to, I mean, it's just a reality. You want to, the league's goal should be to average a million viewers a game, at yeah. least when it's on the national networks and when it's mm -hmm. on Fox or ABC, they should shoot for a million a game, but you know, you're, you're playing a game Saturday in Arlington. It was, I, I was at the stadium ready to go at noon or it was like 11, 12 o'clock kickoff. Like that's, that's, I think that has played a, you know, that plays a, a part in the attendance numbers as well Is you know, people don't want to tailgate at nine, 10 o'clock in the morning. Like, yeah. You know, they, they want to, it's a Saturday morning. They want to sleep in. So I think one, I really hope the league next year will be more realistic with the timing and play games that, you know, you, I guess earliest you can start is maybe two, three o'clock in the afternoon and then always have a primetime game. You should always have a game at seven yep. o'clock. No matter who, no matter who you're competing against, no matter if it's March Madness or something, you need to play games at seven o'clock. You will be competitive no matter what. Will you always get a million viewers? Maybe not, but you're always going to get at least eight, nine hundred thousand, which should be a good number. And two, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm going to say this. You cannot play games on ESPN. You cannot play games on ESPN two this weekend with Houston and Arlington. They're going to be on FS one. I'm telling you right now, those numbers are not going to be good, especially with two Oh, and three teams. If yeah. they, if they can hit half a million, that is a massive win for the league. I am fully expecting that to be three, 400,000 viewers. That is not going to be a very viewed uh, game. And that's so, the only game on Sunday as well. Yeah. And then, <laughs> We can talk about the, the, the Saturday games as we'll well. Get but, there. We'll get there. We'll get there. I promise. But um, um, I, I will say the league, if they want to be successful and they really want to kill in the ratings, 
every game has to be on Fox or ABC. Or if they need to find another network, maybe bring back NBC. Let them get in the game. You know, CBS hasn't been in the game until, you know, since uh, the Alliance of American Football in 2019. Maybe you want to call them in. But every game should be on national television, especially if you want to win the ratings battle. you got to be on it. Because otherwise, if you have games on ESPN, ESPN2, FS1, the reality is it, it ain't going to be high. So I agree with you. I think 534,000 for when the, the time the game was played to what network it was on. I think that's pretty good. I don't think it's great. Um, You know, the XFL in 2020, we're able to still hit a million viewers on ESPN, but it's a different world now. So 534,000. Yeah. You take it as a win. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we're talking about a different time of the year as well. And that's a, that's an argument that many can make. And I, I'm not, I try to just be the, the 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 guy you know representing all sides here and that's it, it's a weird time of year for a lot of people a lot of adults with children especially they got sports they're going to and doing things and it, it so we'll see but and it, i'm hopeful and i'm not very hopeful for this next week though and like i said we'll talk about that more in just a second yeah. uh the 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 regionals are gonna hurt us for sure no doubt about it yeah. but in other news is there anything else on this game uh, in Arlington, you want to cover before I roll on to the next one? Um, I'm just going to say, I know people are going to want to poo-poo on the Arlington Renegades right now, but <laughs> if I if I had to do, I, I'm not Mike Mitchell and do the power rankings for us, but if I had to do power rankings, I still think this is the fifth or sixth best team in this league, and, and that might be a controversial comment to make, but I still, and maybe, maybe it's a little bit of bias since I've been covering this team for four or five years, but I still think Arlington is better than what their record shows. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm right there with you as well. And I, I wouldn't say the same thing about Houston uh, confidently. But I would say that about Arlington. You know, I feel like they've got some potential to spread them wings and fly. We'll see what happens. After last year, I really don't doubt anything that they do either, though. Because last year, we were kind of having the same conversation at this point. I mean, regarding the Renegades. Wondering, what are they doing? What's happening? And then, bam, just took off. Yeah. D- differences this year though if they go four and six they're definitely not making the playoffs because the playoff system is different so yes sir i agree with they, you on that. they they need to win out or at least go six and four if they want any shot of making it yes sir good thing is the xfl conference everybody's got a a, a loss now so it, it knocks yep. it down a little bit makes it even all right let's get brady ray in here brady what's going on man How's it going, Matthew? Very good. I hope you're going to help us uh, break down this Memphis showboats at the Birmingham Stallions game. Memphis was brought down 14 to 33. I mean, it was a defensive and offensive game for those Stallions. They, they looked good, man. They looked real good. And right now, looking at this team, personally, I don't know who can beat them. We will see, but that they're looking very good. I'm glad you said it because I didn't want to sound cocky, but no, they, uh, they I mean, I, I looked on uh, the UFL like website and they are league leader in multiple positions, multiple like categories. Um, the biggest thing for me though, was the attendance. Uh, I think me and you talked about, we were pretty scared about Birmingham's attendance and I want to say we had 12,000 plus for uh during literally the same day as the alabama a day game which i don't know if it was sold out but by pictures it looked packed out yeah it looked busy for sure so very impressed with that um adrian martinez gets the nod for this game and i've all i was very weary of him because he is he's he's erratic he runs like there's no tomorrow and um and to back up the week one stat of what his rushing yards he had 52 off of three carries so that's 17 uh almost 17 and a half uh per carry so he was his feet are clearly his best weapon but then this week he comes out with the 18 for 28 300 plus yards uh showcasing just he's got the all-around ability to be the quarterback uh qb1 honestly yeah he he, he, he impressed me uh and it's that's good for matt Carell though uh it's good it's healthy competition to me uh you got Deion Kane once again seven receptions 144 uh, just a consistent guy for us uh Sternberger and Purse mainly Sternberger I want to talk about the the goofy like gimme catch he had in the end zone that was 
absolutely insane. But other than that, that man consistently targets. He's going to catch it. Yeah. Um, defensively, though, to me, is the real winner. Uh, points allowed through three games, 36. Jeez. And the closest, yeah, the closest team to that is the Panthers with 51. Which I mean, that's that's only what fifteen, but still, uh, we've consistently just been in and out week one, week two, and week three, just the better team. But um, DC is the one I was I was very curious about uh, when I wrote the article months ago. Um, they did only lose one game last year, so that's uh, this will be the biggest test I think for Birmingham. Um, and given it's going to be another home game with another big event that taking place in Alabama, Talladega is going to be there all weekend. So gotcha. going to be interesting to see if we can match 12,000 again, or if we'll be a little under. I plan on being there for that game. We'll see what happens. Haven't got the approval yet, but making the plans. <clears throat> right. So I know I've been following Memphis pretty closely the past few <clears throat> weeks. And I, I've been seeing Case Cookus, man. He, he's taken some hits the past few weeks. But this last game, I mean, he was sacked a lot. 11 mm-hmm. times. That's a lot of sacks. Yeah. And, <laughs> and like, I, I don't know the exact number, but, like, the uh, Birmingham's tackle for loss, I think we have the same amount of tackles for loss as the league leader, but the amount of yards we have tackled for is uh, like double what uh, the person in second place is. But Cookus uh, held him under 200, and he took that big shot right there. I can't remember which quarter it was. We took a huge shot, which I think in turn put Troy Williams in. Yeah, I believe it was before the half. I can't remember correctly, though. Yeah, no, I I mean, I can see it in my my brain. He he got nailed. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And, like, what's crazy, he's – I considered him to be one of the better quarterbacks. And it's not so much on his play as much, so much as the defense is that good. Uh, the yeah. defense. Go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, go you go, go, no, you go. I was going to say, I was going to say when I, I misspoke earlier, Cookies has been sacked 11 times all season. Right. Last night, they sacked him a lot. Or last night, last week, they sacked him a lot as well with eight. So eight sacks, which is still almost 11. <laughs> it's not that much different. Dude, the, the front seven, it's, I mean, it speaks to the camaraderie. Like these, like I said uh, a couple weeks ago, these guys have been together, some of them, quite a long time. Um, they're just, to me, the most cohesive unit of the entire league right now. That can change drastically, though, too, because we haven't suffered major injuries. Um, we've still got DC to play, uh, which I, I keep bringing that up, but DC, I think once they get things turning, I think that could be a very deadly team. You still have Jordan Tiamu and that to me, that's all you really need. We'll see you this week, my friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, Van Hurst said cases had three major injuries between college and pro. Yeah, when week two, the after the game, we were in the pe- press conference, and I asked him straight up, is this sustainable? Are you going to be able to keep taking these kind of hits? And he said, hey, I'm a football player. This is what I do. So I guess he's got it. He's not too worried about it. I mean, I like the moxie. I like the, the courage. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> and it's not, like they, it's not like he ran into any of these hits. This is just pure defense that popped him. Yeah, it's yeah. not like he's a terrible quarterback scrambling for his life, can't make a read. Like he's very talented quarterback, and I've I've been impressed with Memphis so far to start the year. So, um, the first half wasn't even it was it finished eighteen twelve something like that. So uh, I mean they played a great first half. Second half, Birmingham's defense just really showed up, stopped yeah. them. Yeah, they did. It was it was a it was a pretty good game that first half. That second half, they just ran away with it. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think. Go ahead. We had twelve thousand two hundred and sixty five in attendance and eight hundred and thirty seven thousand average TV viewers on Fox. So that was a successful night for the Stallions. Yes. No. By by and large, uh, I didn't even give them having ten thousand. To be honest with you. Same. Same. Uh, I really thought it was. Sadly, I shouldn't have 
but uh, I thought it was going to be like the lowest attendance out of all the teams, to be honest, and then all the home openers. Well, it's just we we get camera angles, and we don't truly know how each stadium is is set up in terms of spots available, how they're seating people. So I, mm-hmm. I, I that that's kind of how I I base it off of. If we can we can see something and it look promising, or but really in person it's a little different. Mm-hmm. That's I don't know. It was like judging from the San Antonio game. I thought there were more people there as well, but that was it was on the lighter side. So right. I mean, they're good with the TV. Anthony, what do you think about the TV numbers here, man? Um, those are those are solid numbers. Um, I, I think especially how it compares to what the USFL was doing last year on Fox. We were we've all kind of talked about last year how NBC was kind of the superior network over Fox when it came down to ratings. It always felt like NBC was beating Fox in the numbers. So, I mean, those are solid numbers. Um especially for a Saturday night, you know, again, competing with a lot of sporting events, you know, with the NBA and the NHL, you know, closing in on the playoffs with that for them, there was a lot of games that had playoff implications. So really good to see those numbers. Also the masters being on. So um, overall, those, those those are, those are good numbers. Um, I want to see Fox still improve because I still think at the end of the day, you know, you look at the numbers ABC has been putting up, you know, even last year and this year versus Fox ABC was doing better than Fox in the ratings. So I really, and you know, it feels like the league has really leaned into Fox as I think over 50% of the games are going to be on Fox this year. So they really need the Fox to step up and have good ratings. So I think 837,000 is pretty good. I still wanted to see see it do better. Like I, I like I said earlier, like I, when it comes down to TV networks, like if you're going to put it on Fox or ABC, those games need to be a million viewers a game. They should they should always be able to shoot for hitting a million each game. So I don't think this is bad, but I'd like to see the numbers keep going up as the year goes on. Yes, sir. Same here. I personally really enjoy these Fox productions, though. Uh, the way they interview players, the way they're the recording, and then you know, interacting with people. I just, I think it's such a better product than that ESPN. Now I think ABC is good as well. I'm not going to take anything from them, but you can tell a huge difference when you watch an ESPN game compared to the other two. I think the atmosphere of a game is just different on Fox versus ABC. I mean, look, I I think a lot of it has to do with the commentary, which, you know, I don't blame ESPN. I like the fact that they're bringing in, you know, new talent and bringing in different talent that they would in a, in a, in a bigger game. I think it's really good. Like Sam Acho, I really like him. I think he does a really good job. Tom Lukenbill, he's been a part of the XFL even back in you know 2001. So like he knows these leagues. So I, I love those guys. I think they do a really, a really good job, but you know, when you have Kurt Metaphy and Joe Clad and Brock Hewitt, and Mark Sanchez, like, and Kevin Kluger, like th- those, those are significant names in the NFL. So those I agree. Voices, I, we know, we all know them. Yeah. 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 Like Fox is, I hate, I don't want to say way superior to ESPN and how the broadcasting is, but it's a much different feel for Fox agreed. versus ESPN. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Now I kind of feel like how the USFL fans felt last year and why they liked it better. It, it, it resonates with me as well. Not being a fan and just appreciating what's going on makes it, it gives me a different viewpoint than what last year where I was actually kind of repping a team. <clears throat> so Brady, anything else you want to cover on this game before we move on? Uh, not anything in particular. I think I touched on everything I wanted to. Sounds good, dude. I appreciate you coming on and, and giving your breakdown, man. Look forward to seeing your work as we go. Yeah. Anytime and always brother. Yes, sir. You the man, Brady. Overtime underdog. Check him out, guys. Facebook and Twitter. Thanks, Thank Brady. You guys. All right. So, uh, Matt, you want me to break some news on here? Yeah, let's do it. So, the UFL announced their transactions just now. Uh, Morgan Ellison, running back, just signed with the San Antonio Brahmas. Oh, <laughs> going to give those Brahma fans a little happiness. That makes me excited as well. Let me pull it up he- real quick. Yeah, he he got play. He's also placed on the inactive list, so I don't know if he's going to be active this week. But it looks like he is uh, now a Brahma. And then uh, uh, Carlos K- Carlo Kemp um, for the Houston Roughnecks looks like he is on the retired list, which I think Ace had reported that. Um, I think he reported that earlier today that he was going to 
probably retire, but he had to step away. With injuries, I'm guessing. Uh, possibly. I don't. I don't. I think it was personal reasons or something like that. But um, Bradley Moore McKinney. Um, I know he got hurt in the uh, Renegades game. I think he left. I want to say second quarter. Um, looks like he's on injured reserve, but. Um, I think the big name here is Morgan Ellison. I, I was very surprised that he was not able to make it as far on the Renegades as he did. So Same. I think that's a that's a really big pickup for San Antonio. Honestly, that's probably the one weak point for the Brahmas. Obviously, besides which the other big news is Chase Garber is pretty much being out for the season. So yes, um, Ellison will be interesting because you know Anthony McFarland's been good for San Antonio. Um, but I don't really feel, and John Lovett's also been pretty good for them, but they haven't really broken out any big runs. So I think the running game is something they definitely need to improve upon. So I'd be interested to see if Morgan Allison gets used or how he is used in that offense. Cause I, I don't, you know, San Antonio is kind of a more of a wide open offense with AJ Smith. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of interested and kind of interested to see how they're going to use Morgan Ellison if they do use him. Yeah, I mean, it's we got Dormandy. He'll be starting there in San Antonio, correct? Uh, right now, yes. But from um, what we're hearing is that they they are going to bring in probably a third quarterback here in the upcoming days. So it looks like that, they didn't they didn't announce anyone. So I'm assuming they haven't signed anyone yet. But they are going to bring somebody in to be the third quarterback. So I'd be interested to see who they bring in. But right now, it's, yeah, it's going to be Quentin Dormandy, and then Tom Flacco is going to be behind him. Cool, cool. Yeah, uh, imagine Cody Latimer is about to get a lot more busy. <laughs> Whatever the well, Brahmas are doing, <laughs> they they have that the two of them were at the Guardians together last year. They have great chemistry. I mean, Cody Latimer, I think, was top three in the league in receiving. Yes, so, sir. Um, and Quinn Dormany is no slouch. I mean, he threw ten touchdowns, five picks last year with uh with the Guardians. He had one really bad game where he threw like three you know three interceptions, but outside of that, I mean, he put on some really good performances for the Guardians. So. Um, I, I, I know a lot of people are kind of panicking, not having Chase Garbers there, but Quinn Dormady is more than capable of starting. Yeah, I agree with you as well. And I was really looking for him to play once the season kicked up. I'm glad that, you know, he, he's actually getting his time now. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Let's bring Mike Bell in. Oh, I wanted to note too. We got white. The Quandre white is back as well on there. And I was surprised when he was let go, but uh, they must be having some, some rotations there in DC. Yeah. He was good with the Brahm, uh, with the, not the, with the Brahma, the Birmingham stallions um, last year. And he's, he's got some, got some, you know, breakaway speed ability. So um, yeah, DC is another one where, you know, ever since, uh, you know, ever since they lost, I'm already spacing out on his name, Abram Smith. Ever ever since Abram Smith's been out for the year, DC's running game has not been as strong. You know, Harris has been pretty good, but obviously he's not at the level that Abram Smith is. So um, maybe White will come in there and compete and help him get some yards. But um, that's that's a that's a good pickup for DC. I wonder if they they're gonna play him. I agree. I agree. Keep him off the board, off of someone else's team for sure. Yeah. All right, Mike. What's up, man? How you doing tonight? Hey, Matthew. How you doing? Good to see you, Anthony. Good to see you, Mike. I love following your stuff. You were talking earlier about, you know, you get to live your dream uh, writing for Sports Illustrated. I'm jealous, and I would love to live that dream someday, too. So <laughs> I appreciate that, man. I'm Thank a big you. fan of you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mike, you were at the game uh, last week. Tell us yeah. more about it. Break it down for us. Panthers took it away 34 to 20 against the Roughnecks. Yeah. It, it started off a pretty good game, and then we quickly saw the Panthers run away with it. Tell us more about it, man. Absolutely. So I felt like this storyline kind of going into the game, the Houston Roughnecks were coming in at 0-2, and, and I think all of us football fans, regardless of league, know there's nothing more dangerous than an 0-2 team. Uh, they're, they're desperate. Uh, you don't want to fall into that 0-3 trap. And this was a game that I felt like could have been really hard for the Panthers, especially talking to Mike Nolan during the week when he was saying it wasn't a must win game for the Panthers. It was more of just a must play good. I thought that wasn't the right uh, edge to have going into it. Uh, and th the storyline for the Panthers was, you know, what is their I offensive identity outside of Jake Bates, who everybody knows and loves? Oh, uh, man. Yeah. 
and is outside of a handful of big plays, um, this offense hasn't gotten rolling. I think they've had really just two solid drives for the first two weeks. It was important for them to get off on the right foot today. And the with the first possession, the Roughnecks just took it all the way down the field. They ran a no-huddle offense. They punched it in for eight. Uh, we thought it was really interesting, the fact that this, after that drive, they went totally away from the no-huddle. Uh, we asked Coach Johnson about that after the game. He, he just said that the amount of coverages that Coach Ballard on the defense was mixing in, it was too much to be able to stay in that no huddle offense. Uh, and, and that kind of just derailed a lot of the, the momentum that they had going. And then it was just like turnover after turnover after turnover uh, of, or I should say penalty after penalty after penalty. And then they just couldn't get rolling. Uh, I thought the Michigan did a lot better in the first half getting started early they got Jake Bates some closer field goals, uh, closer than 60 yards. So they had a 55-yarder and a 46-yarder. Looks like you got Stallions uh, Panthers highlights going on right now. <laughs> That's not my fault. Thank God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wait, yeah. wait, it is. Oh, man, hold on. Yeah. My bad, my bad. Appreciate the call out. Let me go back. Go ahead. Keep talking. Yeah, so the first two weeks – the, the narrative that was kind of surrounding EJ Perry, um, he's he's a great quarterback, makes great decisions, but he was forcing the ball, uh, and, and that kind of bit him as well as the 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 offensive line wasn't holding up their end of the bargain, and it was kind of leading to um, some sloppy reads. He couldn't get off his first read, or he was hold the ball too long. I felt like from the very get go, once he went through his first read and, and got to his second read, he took that quick glance and then he pulled that ball down and used his legs. We saw how dangerous EJ Perry can be. And uh, th that's something that I think will go forward um, being a part of their offense, using utilizing his legs. He knows he's good at that. If he can get that second read, just pull it down and run it, get some yards. The Stallions do that very well. And I think after getting that kind of a game plan against them, they decided to use um, some of those 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 attributes. So uh, it was really close going into halftime, and I feel like the game was was staying close. Had that big play to Marcus Sims, 66 yarder. That dude is a monster. It feels like watching Calvin Johnson back at Ford Field in a way. Uh, he plays like that. He made three or four defender defenders miss on that on that drive that wasn't even like a bomb like last week it was like a 10 yard throw lots of missed tackles uh punched it in for the score and it, it felt like it was so close as anthony kind of touched on this earlier i'm you're no longer confident in like a double digit lead it and i, I felt like that going into the fourth quarter it was like man you kind of really need to be up like 14 points to really feel confident because that fourth and 12 Obviously, you know, it's only been two for two this year, as Anthony said, and one for one last year. But it just has that, like, that hope that you can keep alive. You go down and score, get that onside kick fourth and 12 thing, and go back down and tie it up again. So it that was definitely a worry. But the defense came alive. They put a lot of pressure on Reed Sennett. Um, they sent him into a medical evaluation tent. Breland Speaks came off that play action pass and just whopped him. Uh, I didn't know if he was going to come back in the game. And we saw Nolan Henderson for a little bit. And the defense kind of held strong. He got a blocked kick by Kedrick Whitehead Jr. Uh, for, on the punt. And then Levante Taylor almost pulled down an interception. And then Kai Nakua got the interception on the very next play. They set them up nice. And, and they, they had some nice drives to get down the field. And they pulled it out 34-20. Jake Bates looked good again. Um, we even heard some MVP chants throughout the game when Jake Bates was coming out there. I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, and I think that they, they found an offensive identity. I asked Coach Nolan after the game, uh, you know, what was his impression on the offensive line? Because that left side of the line going into this game was very weak. Ryan Pope got injured uh, early in the game with a left shoulder injury. And they brought in Jared Horst. And I've loved this guy since week one. Uh, I watched him against the Battlehawks take a guy and finish his block straight into the Gatorade coolers. And, <laughs> and that guy just has a nonstop motor. And Coach Nolan touched on that and said it's been a part of their plan to get him in the starting lineup. And it just so happened to work out. So great game by the Panthers. Um, 
One guy I want to point out for the Roughnecks, Isaiah Henney, was an absolute terror. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of, you know, Devin Hester. He just just that danger of every time you kicked him, he was getting it to, you know, good field position or the other side of the field. Even one of them got to the, the red zone. Uh, I asked Coach Johnson if uh, he was going to have any plans of putting him in the offensive packages because you got to use a guy like that, especially with that kind of speed and, and versatility. So, uh, going to be an interesting battle of the winless next week with uh, Anthony's Renegades. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing how the Brahmas do with uh, Quinn Dormady at quarterback. Yeah, yeah, me as well. And I don't know, man. This Houston team is looking rough so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Luckily, Mark Thompson seems like he's coming back this week. Yes, sir. So that will help. Definitely. Um, other than yep. that, I mean, it's like penalties all the game. They had so many penalties. They have a total 26 penalties on the season right now. I don't, I don't know who's close to them in terms of the chart, but I didn't go that far into it. Uh, they have a lead league lead in turnovers, which is five. Mm. And Reed had a pretty good game. I mean, he, yeah, 197 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Yeah, I thought he had a good game too. It it's, it just seemed like that pressure. It was even from the interior with Garrett Marino, uh, Walter Palmer. They were all just getting to him. Uh, Breland speaks. Uh, he's going to be dreaming about him for a while. So, <laughs> no doubt. It was hard to get anything going. It was like as soon as, you know, if, if they weren't getting all that heavy pressure, they were having a penalty. If they weren't having those, they were having a turnover. So, discipline is, is really hurting that team right now. And I hope they can find it. Yeah. And I, I, Coach Johnson seems amazing, and he almost didn't even join the post game press conference. He was that mad. He was, you know, throwing a few things, but uh, we we're happy to have him out there. He has a close relationship with Mike Nolan. So, did you think? I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm not trying to stop you. Thought you were done. Oh, no. I, was uh, that Anthony? No, I, I, I was going to say, I think the one frustrating part about Michigan is. You have Wes Hills and you have Matt Culver, and I wish they can start breaking out soon. I mean, Wes Hills had that good week one game, and then since then, they really haven't been able to establish the run outside of EJ Perry. So I'd love to see those two break out because you have probably two of the best running back tandem in the UFL that I just don't really feel like it's breaking out. But I think a lot of teams are struggling to run the football outside of the of the quarterbacks, obviously, running in. I mean, obviously, we have Adrian Martinez leading the league and rushing so i i love to see those two break out because i mean when west hills can play man he's probably the best running back in this league when he breaks loose so love to i'd love to see more out of that running game and yeah like you you were talking about mike i i wish i could figure out what's going on with this michigan team because when you watch them you're just like how how is this team two and one but right uh major major credit to ej perry i mean i i i i had him low on my quarterback ratings the last few weeks like i i just don't really feel like it's played well, but he played tremendously well against Houston. I will give him a lot of credit. This was a really nice game for him. And, you know, I don't want to chalk it up as him playing against the Houston Roughnecks because the Houston Roughnecks have good defensive players on that yes, team. But, they do. but, but I, I will say I was very impressed with EJ Perry and how he played. I, I think just keeping it simple for him and not having him, you know, bomb it deep as much and forcing those passes. We can talk about Mike, like, you know, yeah. the, the Marcus Sims touchdown, like that was what a five, 10 yard completion yeah, exactly. that ended up going for a touchdown. So yeah, just let your playmakers make the plays. Cause I think Marcus Sims has been, what a surprise he's been. He's probably been right. one of the best receivers in this league. So I think you just keep getting it to your playmakers and, you know, let them get the job done. You know, Trey Quinn is always a reliable receiver for them. They, they have weapons if they can just get in their hands. So um, major kudos to EJ Perry for the performance he had. That was by far his best game of the season. And, you know, if Michigan can find a way to get those running backs rolling, if they can stay balanced offensively, Michigan can be dangerous because that defense is so good. I think that defense is top two, top three in this league outside of Birmingham. Like that's, that's such a really good defense. And that was the one thing that I really liked about Michigan going to the season was their defense. And I absolutely hated their offense, but right, their yeah. offense has been better. They're improving. But I'm still like, man, I look at look at the Renegades, and I still think Renegades are better than Michigan. But um, major major kudos to Michigan's defense and EJ Perry for their performance. That was a really good win for them. They needed that. Yeah, one guy, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay, go ahead, yeah, one guy I want to point out and uh, get some more thoughts from you, Anthony. Uh, C.O.C. Mariner, 
uh, is, came to us from the CFL. I believe he played with Hamilton. Um, I, I'll have to check that. But um, he was he used to play with Jordan Love at Utah State, and he had two crucial catches in this game. One was for a two point conversion, and then when they were only up twenty to fourteen, that that drive that was so crucial. He caught a, a third down pass, a third and long pass that really extended that drive, in which Perry uh, got his league leading fourth touchdown mm-hmm. of the of the season. Uh, so, was, uh, I, t- I did ask Coach Nolan about him after the game, and he said that that was something that they weren't seeing in practice. So he was kind of surprised as well. But he said he had a pretty cool story coming from the CFL. So I don't know if you've heard of him or. Yeah, I'm I'm actually surprised he got as much playing time as he did. I wasn't really expecting him because he was just signed like a week or so ago. But yeah, you know, he did he did have that big 25 yard completion. And I mean, it, it's it's I, I know I know with John Hightower being out, they needed somebody to step up. So good good to see him. I you know he's a solid player for them. And it, and again, I think it, it speaks to the depth of the receiving core. I think that's something you know. Michigan's offense doesn't really get talked about as much as how good the receivers are. You just yeah. wish EJ Perry was more consistent because <laughs> right. they have guys like Devin Gray, they have Mariner, they have Quinn, you know, they, they have really good receivers on that team. They just need to have a quarterback who's more consistent and can get it in their hands because they, they can make plays. This is a better receiving core than I think they get credit for. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah. EJ went 16 for 19, 84%. Uh, that was probably the best of the week. I didn't look, but yeah. it sounds like it. Uh, ran for two scores. He has a league best four rushing touchdowns mm-hmm. on the year. If anybody would have told me that before the season started, I would have laughed. <laughs> and now look at us. <laughs> uh, it's one of our guys, Brian Gertler, was talking about it. Every time they're in the red zone, it's either a, a rushing touchdown or an interception. So, <laughs> As long as he stays injury free, good to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. And let's touch on Jake Bates real quick before we roll out. Yeah. Uh, five for five so far this season. He's had three 55 yard kicks and he's had what one? No, I'm sorry. Three 55 yards and two 62 yards or, or roughly uh, 60 plus. Let's see. 62 and 64. Yep. 62 and then we had 57, 55, and then 46 is his uh, shortest. Wow. Man, he is rolling, dude. He's rolling. And I think it's interesting. I watched him at halftime. He's the only only player that stays on the field at halftime. And he's, I don't know if this is like a sneak preview. This is what's in his head. But he's always kicking from the spot where the NFL extra points are. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what that is. <laughs> yeah. It's like he just wants to be ready or, you know, but. It's interesting to watch him. He never, he never stops every single game I've been to. He's out there the entire half. Um, the other kicker isn't until their players come out. So, it's term- his his story. His story is crazy because it it has so many similarities to Brandon Aubrey's. You know, mm. a, a guy who you know I think they both played soccer. You know, he didn't really kick much in college. He was just a kickoff specialist, and he was one of the best kickoff specialists in the country. Mm-hmm. You know, and they, they have you no know, neither one have really any pro experience. You know, you know, I, I think Jake Bates was in camp with the Houston Texans, I yep. believe, at one point. But um, it, it's incredible to see. And I, honestly, major kudos to all the kickers in this league. I agree. It, the, the the most insane thing has been, you know, in every spring league that we have seen we would be lucky if we had a kicker who averaged <laughs> over 80% in field goal makes. I don't think there's a single one that's under 85% in this league. I mean, yeah. it, it's incredible how good the kickers are in this league. Major kudos to them because I'm telling you, the majority of these guys are going to get NFL shots because there's a lot of NFL kickers out there that are not getting the job done and you know have been missing it. So these guys are going to get opportunities. Absolutely. 50, well said. 52 total kicks this season. There's only been four missed. All wow. Of... Insane. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, we're going to be looking at kickers in a whole nother realm here in the UFL. They really mm-hmm. do make a difference here. And, and that's proven time and time again. We see it. I've, I think the common denominator with these kickers is these are all guys that have strong legs, but maybe have not been consistent accuracy wise. So we're starting to see that they're, actually more accurate than they think we you know we thought they were and but 
they're knocking in these long field goals, which is really good for the league. This is great publicity for them to have really good kickers that are consistent and can hit these long bombs because that's how you're going to make headlines is hitting all these 60 plus yard field goals. So again, major kudos to them. It's, it's awesome to see. Agreed, Absolutely. And Jake agreed. Bates had, uh, some people have said, can Jake Bates kick outside? And they, they posted a video of him nailing a 70 yarder outside in practice. So. Shoot. So he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no concerns there. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Before you roll out, Mike, let's talk about the attendance. 6,952 in attendance, 974,000 average TV viewers on ABC. How did attendance feel to you? You've been present for every home game now for the past three weeks. Tell yeah. me from your basis, what's it looking like? It feels like we got our core. It feels like. 6,952 is the floor. Um, it's been three straight weeks of being booked up against something big in that area. So this week it was the Tigers game in the same time slot. Uh, last week it was the Tigers and the Red Wings in the same time slot. And and week one it was the Big Ten tournament. So uh, uh, it's just so much. I don't know. I, I still expect more even with those things. Um there's some interesting charts out there. It shows like the percentage uh, per capita that we're getting. Uh, that makes you feel a little bit better, but it's, it's you know, it's five more thousand fans. I mean, it just feels like it should be way easier to do. Um, so I guess I was going to, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I mean, I think Avion Plummer wrote a pretty good article today or about building fan trust. And there's just been so much, movement with these leagues do you guys feel that that is a factor in why we aren't seeing better attendance i i'm gonna say this and i'm gonna say this at the very end i hate the hub model and i, I this is a big reason for right. it you need to have these teams practicing i understand the hub model saving money but you got to have these teams practicing in their home you know their home cities you need to have them out in the community i mean that's the only way fans are going to feel connected because right now i i feel so bad for the michigan panthers they have to compete mm. with the detroit lions right now and i'm telling you the, mm. and i know how big the lions are right now just because of their nfc championship run so they have to compete with them i mean that that's a nightmare and they actually have a decent like the panthers this is probably the best team they've had in the last oh, two yeah. years that they've been in existence so this is a massive opportunity for them to get some headlines, but unfortunately they, they don't have the community to really do it. So I, yeah, this is, this is why you, you, they, they eventually got to get out of Arlington and have these teams in their own cities and they got to do more marketing. I mean, they got to do more yes. marketing in these cities. They got to have them out in the community. Have, you know, they just did community service work yesterday in Arlington and that was awesome to see, but unfortunately it's only going to affect fans that live in Arlington or in the Dallas area. It's not going to really affect what they're doing in, in Detroit, Michigan, that's not really going to do much for them. So by a hundred percent, but like I, the, the attendance numbers don't look good. And I'm going to be honest, if those attendance numbers don't get better, I, I don't really see a reason to have a team there, but I will say again, they, I, I doubt they make any changes because I think 2025 is going to be, you know, the make or break year for this league when it I comes agree. down to it. So I think they knew like this year may not be as, as great as they anticipated. So I love to see these last two home games for them do better. I, I really hope they don't do any worse than that. But from my understanding from, you know, Mike was, was telling us, he heard that, no, this is actually better than what Michigan was doing last year in attendance. So, I mean, if you want to take a positive of it, it seems like they have more fans this year than they did last year. So, I mean, let's give them their credit. They are kind of building something there, but a lot more needs to be done in, in that community. So I hope eventually they'll move away from the hub get these teams in their home cities. And then I think that will help with attendance numbers. Perfectly yeah. said. Yeah. I see that as well. My thing was we rushed so much, especially Michigan. It seemed like it was the most last minute. Uh, yeah. An announced in terms of scheduling and tickets. It didn't seem like yeah. it mattered much in that, and in, to the league in that. And I don't say that disrespectfully, but when, when the season when when season tickets are on sale and single game tickets aren't and you have a three week home game series, you really want to make sure those single game tickets are ready to go. That's a priority. Absolutely. So that Absolutely. I attribute some of that to that. And then plus thinking in you know the Lions from two, three years ago 
were almost uh, they're almost like a, a Washington, you know, NFL team where their fans weren't very really big on them. They didn't really have the hype and hoorah. And so I think if we'd have been talking in a different time, this would look different for these Panthers. But since the Lions are on their feet and they're running, man, it, the the fans are hungry for the Lions now. So it's yeah. a little different of a market than what it was, I think, thought up to be. I, I think we have to make the championship um, to get people there. I think that will start rallying people there this season. Otherwise, kind of like Mike G saying, you know, it does need a couple seasons to establish the base. So, yes, sir. Agree. Anthony, you got anything on it for we close him out? Um, hey, t- what's 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 end us on a positive note? TV rating is really good. I, mean, I agree. To close yeah. to a million like that. Let, let's talk about that. That's really impressive for a game that maybe wasn't really the sexiest game of the weekend. Um, really good ratings to have close to a mill. So major kudos there. Again, I, I think ABC is going to get more ratings than I think Fox, because that's just how the trend has been in the past. So I think those were really good numbers for a game that maybe wasn't considered the best one of the weekend. So major kudos there. And I heard we're beating the NHL yep. uh, as, as the league. So that's that's amazing. Yes, sir. We're looking good. I think the TV numbers are promising, and that's why I was saying – you know, we we dropped down to five hundred thousand across the board. I think there's some terms to worry about then, but it, it right. for the most part we're averaging out pretty well. Absolutely, and, and it's gonna be fun when we get to playoff season. I think, and to have that championship, that'll be I think that'll be a blast, especially the, in the the Battle Dome. What a perfect yes, place! Yes, sir. It should be a good one, no doubt. Mm-hmm. Well, Mike, I appreciate you, man. As always. Yeah. We'll see you next week. Let's talk again. Uh, Sounds good. Appreciate you, Matthew. It was great to see you, Anthony. Great to see you. Appreciate you, Mike. Take it easy, man. Be All right, good. You guys take care. Yes, sir. Bye bye. So, Rig Rockers, he's a super fan. Uh, they've been traveling around following the Roughnecks, and he said the only way the average fans will get excited is by having these players out in their community interacting with them. And I agree. Uh-huh. It makes a huge difference. Thousand percent agree. That that's the only way this thing is really going to work. I mean, that's what makes like you look at like indoor football league and stuff like that. Like that's what makes those like arena leagues work is that they focus so much on what's going on in their local communities and being out there and you know having affordable prices for family and that like they may not they may not get like ten plus thousand fans of their games and they they may not make millions of dollars, but that type of stuff really makes a difference in them having consistent fan base and be able to be profitable and be able to um, stay sustainable as teams for years to come. Like here in Frisco, like we can, that team, no, it does help. They play really well, but they have a good, I mean, they're out there in the community all the time doing great things. So, I mean, that that's what the, the UFL needs to focus on. Agreed. And that's what we loved about the, uh, the 2020 XFL. I loved about it. We yeah. saw that that buy-in in those communities, especially places like St. Louis, where you before the season was going, man, there were people just ready to rock. And I, you kind of don't forget that. The the vibes preseason were very different than what they were now. For sure. <clears throat> Agreed. All right. Last but not least, we got RJ coming to the party. RJ, man, sorry to keep you. This has been a discussion tonight. How's no it going your way? Yeah, it's doing good. How you doing? Very good, very good. So Excellent. you were in attendance for San Antonio. Yes, sir. Uh, how how did it go, man? Give us a little breakdown on it. Well, I mean, other than the, the loss, the, I thought the, the game was, was good. Uh, I know they announced that attendance was only like 11,000, but it did seem to be much, much larger than that. Uh, I thought the crowd was pretty wild. Uh, but as far as the game goes... Uh, I mean, you look at the statistics, and the, it was so close. And just statistically speaking, it looked like the Brahma should have won the game. Um, yardage, we were beat them in yardage. We beat them in the pass yards. Uh, they did have the edge in rushing yards. Uh, penalties have always been a bad problem for us so far this year, and we cleaned that up significantly. We only had one penalty. So that, I thought that was a major key to, to this game. Where we lacked in this game we seem to do a lot of dinking and dunking in this game uh you look at the stats here the average play was only 3.7 yards per play i mean it was a lot of at the scrimmage plays a lot of behind the scrimmage 
uh, screen passes. Uh, it was just not a lot of downfield action that we have seen in the past. And I think that's where the big problem for the team was. It was just not, not a lot of down, down the field passes. Um, we did get to A.J. McCarron a couple times. We did get two sacks. But other than that, we really didn't seem to pressure him a lot. He, deems, he did seem to have a lot of time in the pocket and was able to move around and find open receivers. Uh, there's this one play, uh, like you saw there in the highlight there, that play happened over and over and over again, and it just seemed to work for St. Louis so many times. And how can you leave Hakeem Butler wide open like they did? <laughs> I mean, that guy, I don't know why he's not in the NFL. I mean, that guy is a beast. And we left him open too many times uh i i thought that was a pretty bad and as far as our offensive line goes I was, now chase garbage did not get sacked one time which is good but he did seem to be running around quite a bit they they did pressure him quite significantly uh, so i thought the battle of the trenches definitely went the battle hawks way they seemed to take away a lot of our stunt plays they had a lot of pressure uh, on our quarterback, and they and they did seem to protect AG a lot better than we did. And then the other thing I would notice was the red zone. Uh, our red zone defense so far this year, we did not allow a single touchdown in the red zone. Then St. Louis came by, and they were two for two in the red zone while we were three for five. Uh, we were perfect in the red zone offensively. Uh, but we just couldn't punch it in those couple times. And that was the big difference, I think, right there. And yeah, that play right there, wide open, Hakeem Butler. You know, he just, just can't do that. Uh, and now we see that Chase Garbers was injured. Uh, they're saying that it was possibly that late hit out of bounds. That's what caused the injury. But give credit to him. He stuck in the game whenever that injury happened. He stuck in there and completed the game. So got to give him you know, tip our hats off to him. Uh, maybe that was reason why there was a lot of short passes is that maybe he was injured earlier than what they thought. And he just didn't have a good grip on the ball. So it was a lot of like short passes, but yeah, there was something off about, about him uh, on that game, just too many short passes. And now we just saw on the transaction page that Greg Island, another one of our offensive linemen is out and, possibly going to be out for the rest of the season and that's after losing Alex Millette for possibly the rest of the season as well too and man we just got hit by the injury bug and it's just biting us over and over and over and it's just uh kind of we're, we're losing players left and right and it kind of got me a little concerned about that yeah I don't blame you for being concerned man especially when you're starting QB you're told is is out on IR we don't know the for sure injury we don't know for sure you know how long it's going to take him to recoup but five weeks at least is a long time to lose your starting QB yeah, absolutely now I mean, the grand gr the good thing is that we do have Quentin Dormany uh he is definitely a more than adequate backup yep. uh, quarterback I mean most of us fans probably thought that he was going to be the QB one going into the season and when Chase was named the starter, a lot of us were kind of shocked. I mean, I was. I thought Quentin was going to be the hands-down starter. So now that he is going to be the starter, I have, I have absolute confidence that you're not going to see much difference in our offense between Chase and Quentin. I think the offense is going to continue to click as it was before. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a significant drop in quality of play. And now that he's teamed up with Cody Latimer, as we I heard you guys mention earlier, that they had chemistry when they were with the Guardians for, uh, last year. So I think that's going to be a really, really a key aspect is that you have a security blanket like Cody Latimer that you can rely on to bail you out in situations until he kind of gets warmed up and kind of knock that rust off and get back into a uh, game flow. So that is going to be a key. Um, a key point in his success. Agreed. I, Agreed. I, I, I think one difference too, that I think is really going to help this Brahma's offense is I think Quinn Dormany has a stronger arm than Chase Garbers has. Mm -hmm. I think that was the big knock with Garbers is that he didn't have that, that strong of an arm, but he was really accurate with the football. I think Quinn Dormany has a stronger arm than him. So that might actually open up the offense a little bit more to 
get guys like John Jay Kirkland, who is a, a deep threat, be able to you know, bomb it deep to him or Stevenson or Latimer. So I think that will op- open up the offense a little bit. But you know, you you were just t- RJ, you were just talking about the, the injuries. Like it, it really is disappointing to see how many injuries the Brahmas have had. But I will say, major kudos to them on their depth. I, I think Wade Phillips deserves a lot of credit for the Absolutely. roster he has built. He had the most impossible job of anybody in this league to build a roster basically from scratch. And he has done such a phenomenal job of putting that roster together. And I I think he has a lot of depth to that team that I think San Antonio can still be competitive. I, I, you know, I, I don't know without Garbers, if there's, if they can maybe hit that seven, eight win number, like maybe they could have, I think this is a team that looks like they could hit five, six wins and, you know, stay competitive in the uh, XFL conference. I think the only, challenge they'll have is dc i don't know if arlington you know arlington is good i think they'll be competitive but i think san antonio will get at least one game on them so i really think it's just going to be depending on how they play against dc but again major kudos to wade phillips for the depth that he has built with this roster because they're they're fighting through like the secondary how many injuries have they taken in that secondary and they're still you know they've they've, got plenty men ready yeah i mean they, they the i think the secondary now maybe struggles with making those open field tackles but they're still solid in coverage like this is still a pretty good secondary so i will say even with all these injuries happening san antonio should stay competitive throughout the season oh absolutely absolutely i still think we're of course i'm drinking the brahma kool-aid so i'm thinking we're still (laughs) going to go eight and eight and well, no, I think we're going to go nine and one. Yeah, this will be the only loss of the season. So, I like it. I like That's it. Bold. That is bold. <laughs> we saw Cody Latimer. He had seven receptions week three. And then we had John Trey Kirkland with eight. So both of these guys are utilized, and mm-hmm. the Cody Latimer only finished with a total of fifty-eight yards. With John Trey Kirkland had fifty-two yards. So. I think both of them will be very busy with Mr. Dormandy once he approaches the field. It, yeah. You know, yeah. There's a lot of things that these guys can do and get downfield that people cannot keep up. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would like to see our running game improve. I, I think the running game has been lacking so far. And it did seem like we were running the ball pretty effectively at points in the game and they just kind of got away from it for some reason and yeah all all year long our running game has not been as impressive as i would like it to be and i think we really need to get that ball rolling but boy i don't know if we can do that against the the motor city kitties up there because they got a they got a pretty good defense so that's that's going to be a tough task for us there and like Anthony yeah. was saying earlier, that's that's what's happening season round. I mean, that's everybody's struggling to get the run going. Mm-hmm. It's not just you guys. Yeah, I mean, it's disappointing because Anthony McFarland. I mean, he's a former fourth round pick, and he he's. I mean, he had some nice runs for San Antonio. Yeah. Like you can see, mm-hmm. like he's he can he's an NFL caliber running back, but he has just not been able to really open up. And that's why I'm interested, like with Morgan Ellison now in the picture, like. Is he going to start getting some more some carries? Is he going to get in the rotation? Because like, you know, McFarland and John Lovett, those are both good running backs. I mean, those mm-hmm. are starting caliber running backs for most of the teams in this league. And for them not to be able to open up, I'm interested to see if Morgan Ellison starts getting some carries too for them and, and see if he he can open it up because he was fantastic with the Sea Dragons last year before his injury. Right. And I may be wrong in this, but Morgan Ellison was utilized in the passing attack as well right i mean do i remember that correctly uh was a little somewhat bit. yeah somewhat but i i think his his strength is running the ball and i think that's anthony mcfarland's strength is in the passing game Understood. so being able to to get him in the passing game i think that's why he you know even if he's not running the ball as well i mean he's he's still making some catches out of the backfield i think that's they they want to use him for that because john lovett is not the the guy who's going to be you know, catching two, three passes of the game. He's the one that's going to be, um, you know, running, running the ball and getting those tough yards. Yeah. Mike G said he broke his hand or broke his wrist. Was it hand yeah. or wrist? Uh, so, so, so I think Mike Mitchell said, and we were talking about this last night, he believes that it's the, in the third quarter, he took a light hit on the roughing the passer penalty on him and i think that's where he got injured that's what we believe i don't know if that's a hundred percent when he got hurt 
but I think that's when he he had injured. So I think we originally thought he was he was running out of bounds late in the game, and I think he took a hit. But I actually think it, we we think it was sooner than that. We think it was the roughing the passer penalty in the third quarter is where he hurt his wrist. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, Van Hurst said Mark Lillybridge is the GM in San Antonio. So I mean, yeah, this is just the Houston Roughnecks staff that moved over to San Antonio. We we knew that. Uh, very similar team, but not completely the same as what no, they were. I, quarterback plays a lot, I think, better this year than it was last year. I mean, oh, Cole agreed. McDonald was nice, and Brendan Silvers was nice, but they didn't play consistently enough last year, especially when Kirkland got hurt. That Roughnecks team kind of offensively mm-hmm. took took a little bit of a plunge. So they have more that's – the, that's the shameful part about not having Chase Garbers is he was playing really consistently – um, at quarterback, and that's something they needed. But hopefully, Quentin Dormney keeps that consistency going for them. We shall see. Good luck to your Brahmas, RJ. Let me ask you on the attendance. So you're saying it, it definitely felt like more people, right? I mean, it. Oh yes, I, I think they said it was eleven thousand was the announced attendance. But looking around, I'm sitting up in the Lone Star Club, so I got a nice little bird's eye view right at the fifty yard line, and just looking around, it it was a bigger crowd than 11,000. I I'm not sure what happened with those numbers. I'm not trying to get any conspiracy theories or anything like that there, but the numbers did look way higher than just 11,790. Like, like you have up there on the screen. Now I got it fixed. It looks yeah, much bigger than that. I gave you Ford Fields numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely thought the crowd was bigger than that. Yeah. It, it looked much bigger. So you yeah, had a hundred. Antonio- I'm sorry. Go ahead. San- no, I was gonna say San Antonio is. All, I think probably this. I mean, if Birmingham can figure it out, they they really should be better than when they're at. But I think San Antonio's atmosphere, like when I went to the championship game last year, like watching the game in the in the Alamo Dome, it, it's a really good atmosphere. So I, I think the Brahma fans are probably it's probably second or it's probably tied between second and third strongest crowd um in, in in a game outside of st louis but um i mean it, it's it looked good on tv it sounded loud there so i mean right. I, I, yeah. I i you know i i agree even even just the if it's under twelve thousand, like that 12 that that 11,790 they they came out i mean they definitely came out and it felt it felt like a really good atmosphere on television mm-hmm. and i know it, we were competing against the spurs the spurs had their very say. last game of the season at the same time so that could I could have played a, a factor in maybe the low attendance, but yeah, I still think it was more than 11,000. So the game one, there was 13,000. I mean, judging from that, do you feel like there was more for this game than, than game one? You were present. Well, actually, I think there was more than that than we had in game one. Yeah, I, I think I think there was. There was not as many big sections of empty seats like there was in, in, in the first game. Uh, the the stands did feel a little bit more filled out. How about Battlehawk fans? Did you see a lot of them? Oh, that they, they were they were there. They, <laughs> they were, were sick. There. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. They they showed up and they showed out. So uh, kudos for them for for traveling. But yeah, they they were definitely there. One million average TV viewers on ABC. This was the hit this week, and I'm not surprised with it being the Battlehawk San San Antonio. It did. That's that's great, and I figured, and I'm happy that we see this million mark here. Makes me very thrilled. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the number they need to hit for every single time. And th- this this had a lot on the line with it. I mean, with St. Louis and San Antonio, these are two of the best teams in the league. So I think, and it, the game lived up the expectations. It was a, it was a good game from start to finish. So I think if you're the UFL, you're you're really happy with not only the ratings but how the game went. This was. Right. That that's a, this, this was a big win for 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 the league this weekend. And plus, yeah. I think it did help that it was at two o'clock instead of eleven o'clock in the morning. Agreed, hundred percent. That helps. Yeah, big difference there. Everybody's home. Time to watch football. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Turn it on and do it. <laughs> I mean, RJ, I, I think you guys have a shot at taking this championship home. Now, with the questions that need to be answered, we'll see what happens, but. This team looks pretty good, in my opinion, and I look forward to seeing what they do down the yeah, road. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Let's just get that one loss out of the way, get that uh, T 
taste out of our mouth and now we got the rest of the season to to recover i'd rather get our loss now instead of at the end kind of like with the defenders you know and they started off what nine and oh or whatever and then got that loss and floundered in the in the championship game so let's get that loss now and get on fire when it counts yes sir agreed with you there anything else you want to leave us with before you depart ah, i think i'm good thank you matthew for having me I appreciate you coming on, RJ. Hey, guys, check out RJ. He's he's pretty consistent on his writings on alternativefootballnetwork.com. Check him out. He's always doing game previews as well as game summaries following the game. So check those out. Good Thank work. You. Appreciate you, RJ. Yes, sir. All right. Until Point next forward. time. <laughs> Point forward, man. Bye-bye. All right, bye. All right. So we're wrapping up the game breakdowns. So hour and 30, I'm trying to get under two hours. I'm trying. <laughs> there's so much to talk. The problem is there's so much to talk about, especially with the season. So yeah, the, the actual football and the attendance and then the TV and you know, it, it's, it's a lot of, of data to review and it's kind of one of those things that sometimes it's subjective. So you gotta be kind of mm-hmm. hesitant on how you talk about it. So I don't know, but yeah, Regardless, appreciate the guys coming on, breaking down the games, and appreciate your breakdown of that Arlington game as well. Yeah, yeah, a ton of fun. I appreciate the invite. Yes, sir, always. You're always welcome on, Anthony, seriously. Well, call me anytime, man. You know I'm down for it. Let's jump into a brief review of week four's games. Like We don't have to talk about teams and game plans. Let's just discuss you know, when and where and who. So Saturday, April 20th, this is our early game, Memphis Showboats at St. Louis Battlehawks. It's 11 a.m. CST, 12 p.m. EST, and it comes on ABC. So this is an early one. What are you, what are you feeling about this game, man? Um, I mean, I feel like this is should be an easy St. Louis win. I mean, I, I really – I. I feel so bad for Case Cookus. I mean, can we get this guy a good offensive line for once? Because he <laughs> has just been beaten, battered, and bruised over the last few years that he's been in these spring leagues. I mean, I mean, he's really the Andrew Luck of spring football. I mean, this guy is going to take a, a beating, and he's, he's going to be so banged up when he retires. So um, I, I, I think St. Louis is outside of Birmingham is the most complete team in this league. They just have everything that you want out of a team. Um, offensively, they're really strong. I'm fascinated to see. I mean, Jacor Pearson went on his uh, Instagram page and made a comment saying he's going to play. So I'm interested to see if he's actually going to be active and playing because if Pearson plays, oh boy, <laughs> we are looking at the best offense in this league and it's about to get really dangerous with the with the Battle Hawks. The one thing I really like about the Battle Hawks, they've gotten their running game going. They got Durant and Slayers who have ran the ball really well. Um, I don't know what's going on with uh, Wayne Gallman, but it, it really seems like he's pro- his. I don't know if he's going to ever be active again, just compared to what those two guys that, with Durant and Slayers have done. So I really like what what they've been doing on the running game, especially the last couple of weeks. It seems like they're really getting that going. So if they can keep that consistent. This is the best offense in the league. Um, Memphis, I mean, I want to see them protect Case Cookus. I mean, he, he can't keep taking the hits that he can. If he keeps taking the hits, that he, he has to, then they're going to have to put in Troy Williams because Troy Williams is a better runner than he is. But Case Cookus can't be running for his life and just taking all these hits. So if you give that guy time, I mean, Case Cookus is a top four quarterback in this league. So it's going to be really important that Memphis protects him because St. Louis, I mean, they got Travis Feeney, they got PETA, like they they have a ton of pass rushers that can get to him. I mean, this this could this has the potential of Case Cookus getting sacked five to six times again. And they, they can't have that happen. So I, I like St. Louis in this game. I think they're going to win. I wouldn't be surprised if it's I, – I don't want it to be a double-digit game, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is, to be honest. Yeah, if they're just picking up from last week and taking off again, you can definitely expect some points on that board. I'm curious what the over is on this. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not big on the gambling end of it this year. Because that uh, – you would let think me, – me, Yeah, let me fall off DraftKings because I know I think it did come out today with the UFL game lines let me see what it says last week he completed eight he completed passes to eight players and it says he ran for a 10 yard score i mean this dude was on fire and he was fired up too during the game you could see him talking and and yelling and you know doing what he needs to do as a quarterback yeah, and I think Memphis – I mean, Memphis really needs a running game too. I mean, they, they have not been able to run the ball well. I know Trey Williams got cut today um, from the team. I know they're bringing in a, a new back. So, 
Um, that'll be interesting to see if if that helps them at all. But um, yeah, they they really need to get some help in the in the running game. Yep. Um, okay, so St. Louis is minus seven, and that's actually not the biggest margin Mm-mm. this week. That's the second largest, but. Uh, the really fascinating part about the bets this week is the over unders are much higher than they have been. They were very con- they were very conservative, sitting at like forty forty one. Uh, this game is forty five point five, so that's at least uh, I think it, they're starting to feel more comfortable betting on the over on it. So um, not surprised St. Louis is minus seven. I I, w- I have them winning this game, and I think it can be a I think it has the potential to be a blowout. Yeah, agreed, agreed, and this is going to be a big one. I'm sure we'll have a lot of fans there in St. Louis. Yeah. Let's move on. So we got our, our double header Saturday evening, and this is the Fox Regional game at home, guys. So it depends on where you're at, where you're going to watch which game. Now, personally, I'm sure you can tell me more about this, Anthony. I went, I tried to find a regional map. It's not available I emailed uh, a couple people in the UFL. I haven't got a response back. Just curious. Do you know where 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 your people can watch this game depending on the area? So, I mean, we haven't been given a regional map. My assumption is, like for me living in the Dallas area, I'm we're probably getting the Michigan San Antonio game. Um, I'm I'm I think nationwide. My assumption is nationally, it's probably going to be DC and Birmingham. That's that would I've probably seen. that would that would probably be my assumption. Um, my plan for Saturday is I'm probably going to get the Fox Sports app and I'm going to be probably having to put it on my computer and watching both games at the same time. So, I mean, I know there's a lot of opinions on it. I personally hate it with a passion because I want to watch every game on national television. And I think it really is going to hurt the ratings of these leagues. But, you know, this is something the XFL did it back in 2001. They would uh, simulcast games at the same time where they would, they would, they would put one on NBC and the other on UPN. So, I mean, it's not, it's not something we haven't seen in spring football in the past. I I just don't think it's highly recommended to do it, but I I would, I am fascinated to see what the ratings are going to end up being for these games. But, I mean, my assumption is this DC Birmingham game is probably the one that's going to be on national television. And then I'm sure most of Texas and um, pro- probably Mich- Michigan, the state of Michigan, I'm sure they're going to get the, the, the Brahma's Panthers game. So let me announce the game. I forgot to even do that. We're getting to the two hour mark starting to drag <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, April 20th. The DC defenders are at Birmingham stallions. That game starts at 6 PM central 7 PM Eastern and it's on Fox. So that's, that's game one on the header. Next up you have Michigan Panthers at San Antonio Brahma's. That game starts at 6 PM central 7 PM Eastern and it's on Fox. So this is what we're talking about here. It's regional. I looked in my area and I'll, I see I'm getting the DC Birmingham game in which I'm not surprised because I'm, I'm somewhat close to them. Uh, so I don't know. I, I do like the app idea, but see, I went and got YouTube TV just to be able to watch some of these games as it is. So it's, it's tough for me to, to do any more, you know? Yeah, I have YouTube TV also, but I'm going to assume I'm getting the San Antonio game. But I mean, what what a shame that these are the two games that have to compete against together. These are two. These are probably two of the best games of the weekend. Two mm-hmm. games that have two and one teams going against each other, and America's only going to be able to see one or the other. So <laughs> that's a shame. But yeah, I'm gonna I'm probably gonna have to get the Fox Sports app and make sure I'm able to pull up both games because they're both good. I think these could. I don't know how I don't I don't know Michigan San Antonio is going to be as good of a game, but um, especially the DC um, Birmingham game that is going to be a fascinating matchup to watch. Well, I guess Birmingham is three and zero. I should correct myself. They're three and zero, but it's all teams with winning records, so it's yeah. going to be a really good Saturday night for football. Going to be a battle for sure, and it makes me disappointed if I do go in person because now I'll definitely have to catch this later on or record it. I guess. Yeah, should be should be both fun games, but um, hope hope I think what will be interesting is how they're going to handle it on the national television, like how they're going to handle it during the games. I assume there's going to be a lot of like cut-ins and like, yep. hey, this is what happened the pre, this is what happening in the in the game. I know like ESPN when they did the simulcast Monday Night Football games, they would you know on occasion pop it up on a small screen and show you <clears throat> the current action going on. So 
I think we'll probably see a lot of the same with the with the Fox games. Mike G said, where'd your comment go, Mike G? He said, we'll get a good look at what markets are watching slash supporting their team. That's true as well. That's true. Uh, well, I guess we, we will see who's the, the stronger fan base between, uh, you know, Birmingham, D.C. and Michigan and San Antonio. That That would be really interesting to see the breakdown regionally from those games. But let's move on to our last Sunday game. Uh, that's on April 21st. That's the Arlington Renegades at Houston Roughnecks. Starts at 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern, and it's on FS1. Ooh, somebody's got to win this, right? <laughs> no ties I mean, here. <laughs> I mean, look, if you're going to have a game on FS1, I hate to say it, this is probably the game you want on FS1. You you you, you don't you don't want two zero and three teams going at it on, or maybe you do want it because you may have a better chance of getting better ratings. This is going to be the lowest rated game in the season. I'm just telling you right now. Like I, I if this like I said earlier, if this game hits half a million, that is a massive win for the league because I doubt there's going to be many people watching this game. Um, I it, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, you know, especially the big story is if Mark Thompson can come back. That's going to be a problem for Arlington because Arlington has not been the best against the run. So I, I think with Mark Thompson in there, that offense can actually look pretty decent for Houston. Um, I still think Arlington is going to win. I think they should be big favorites to win. But um, this is a game that it's must win, especially when you have 10 games in a regular season. If you start 0-4, I mean, you're toast. You would have to go on a massive winning streak and just hope that you can get in. So um, I think whoever loses this game, you can go ahead and, you know, sign your, your ticket to, uh, watching the games, watching the postseason at home. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. What is FS one? What's a typical rating there? I tried to Google it. I couldn't find anything legitimate, but um, I'm, curious. I'm trying to think, I think with the USFL last year, I think they were doing about three to 400,000. Gotcha. gotcha. So well, I, I, I doubt I doubt they're going to hit over a half mil. And that's why I'm saying, like, if they hit over a half mil, I think if you're the league, you're celebrating that because that is a massive win. We know collectively most – we're all the same people watching every game. So that's – you would think it would at least pull that, hopefully, looking at the past numbers. Mm -hmm. Just We don't have anything else going as UFL fans that day. It's just the FS1 part that really is tricky as well. You know, if this was ABC or Fox, this is an easy pickup, an easy – watch but with the fs1 it's a little different as well yeah if this was on if this game was on national television like if it was on abc or fox i could probably see it do seven to eight hundred thousand i think that would be considered a win because unfortunately this is not a game that's going to really attract people to watch but on fs1 i mean my my prediction is i probably say maybe does four hundred thousand i like it i'll take it that wouldn't be bad i think 400 wouldn't be bad 500 would be a massive win no, no, yeah. And I'm curious too how the attendance is going to be there in Houston at Rice. It was a little choppy that first game of the season. So hopefully it picks up. Yeah, I think with less competition, well, you, you got the, I think the Houston Rockets are in the play. Are they in the playoffs? I think. I don't, I don't, me. Not, uh, I, I don't know. Not outside of my boundaries of, of information. I mean, <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, this they only did like over 9,000 um in in their first home game so 91,000 or 9100 9157 yeah. yeah that's going to be really interesting because Houston was pretty good in the tens last year i mean i think they were doing like 13 14,000 last year so um i think they need to hope they can if they can get over 10,000 i think that would be a win for a game like this but i got a feeling it may dip a little bit more with with Houston i i can yeah. see it i can see this being Eight to nine thousand, maybe less than that. That might be too optimistic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want to say too. I've been there. I went there that first game, and I mean, it, the the layout. It's an older stadium, but the the area surrounding Rice and then the stadium itself, man. I mean, you just it, it's got a lot of history. The area is nice. It, people have a reason to go. It's just getting in there is the hard part. Yeah, I mean, I went I went to Houston last year for the. Um, division championship game between Houston and Arlington. And I mean, the, the stadium was great. The atmosphere was awesome, but there was a lot of construction around there. I mean, the, it seems like they were doing a lot of work on it. So I'm, I'm glad that they're not playing in there this year because I mean, they, they need to get through their construction and be done with it. And then it'll be, 
it'll be better when they can get back in there. But I, 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 I mean, it seems like Rice Stadium, like that area, seems nice. Like <clears throat> it didn't nice, seem bad. Right? On, yeah, it didn't seem bad on television. It's no, just it's you know, like to see a lot more fans in there. Exactly, I agree with you. That TC, that TDECU, you, you were hesitant to walk around at night outside of there. I'll tell you that. Yeah. At, at Rice. Yeah. We were staying close by and we did everything over in Rice Village and beautiful, beautiful place. So, yeah. yeah. Had a comment from Chris Mason. This is a good one. The poop bowl. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, the most G rated way of putting, putting it. I, I hey, he could have been up. explicit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Chris is always chiming in with some good comments. <laughs> so, gotta, gotta highlight him. Appreciate you watching, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, this uh, we'll see what happens with this game, man. It, I'm I'm saying Renegades right now, but who knows if the Roughnecks can find their identity and, and get a little more disciplined, and I think they can actually play some football. We just got to see if it happens. They have really good individual talent. I think that's a frustrating part is their defense is really good. I mean, defense they, they have is like studs. They have Chris Odom. They have Ruben Fletch, uh, Foster. Like <clears throat> they have talent on that defense, um, even offensively. Like the, I think the shameful part this year is they've not been able to get Justin Hall really going. I mean, he caught a touchdown last week, but I really don't feel like he's really broken out as much as they would like him to be because he was a stud for the gamblers last year. Yeah. I mean, he was one of the best receivers in the USFL. So I think they would like him to get involved more. It's just, unfortunately, they have no running game. I mean, TJ Pledger has not been able to really do any. I mean, that running game has been atrocious the first three weeks. So that's why, like, if they can get Mark Thompson back and he can get rolling, uh, I with Reed Senate, I think that's a really good looking offense that could really open up and really perform well. Like last week, I think was the best offensive performance of the season for Houston, despite the fact that they lost the game. I still think it was their I think they look better with Reed Senate. Definitely agree with that wholeheartedly after watching, you know, for two weeks and paying attention closely. Moving that ball is crucial and that he can do it. He can throw it down that field. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, yeah, I will say defensively, they look good. And that defense can't carry them to a win, though. They just can't. They got to have some offense. Yeah, their offense is not good enough for them to get to that point. I think they can potentially get there, but um, it's going to take Mark Thompson coming back for that to happen. Have you heard anything about that? You know, you've seen him hint to it last week that he may be returning last week and he didn't, and he's done it again this week. So just curious, have you heard anything on your end? I'm sure there's some hesitancy with putting him back in because they probably don't want to get him hurt, but I think they're at a point now where it's make or break. So I honestly probably, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the week he finally comes back because if they lose this game, then I mean, their season's over. Like yep. they, I don't, I don't, I don't think they're going to get into the playoffs. So if they want any shot of making it, they, he's going to have to play and, and roll out there. But yeah. so my gut feeling would be, he is going to play and I'm sure he's going to get the ball a lot. They're going to need to get him rolling very quickly. Um, if he sits out this game, I think you can go ahead and chalk it up as a <clears throat> as a Renegades win. Agreed. Agreed. We shall see what happens. Now, in terms of him playing, what we didn't know until Friday, correct, that he wasn't playing? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, because <clears throat> I think he was included on the injury report. Yeah, yeah. But I know they were chiming. There was there was people talking to me on on different capacities about how he's returning, and I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. And he didn't. So that's what no, I believe now. At this point, he's got to, as you said. There's no yeah. It left. De it definitely feels like they were being conservative with it mm -hmm. because they didn't want to risk him getting hurt again. Because you know he missed a couple games last year with them. So I mean, I I, I hate to say he's injury prone but he is borderline like has been banged up a little bit you know from last year to this year so um, they want to play it safe with them because he is their the, the key weapon offensively yeah i've seen on twitter he dropped some weight too so that may be helping him as well stay injury free yeah i mean hopefully he kept the muscle because he, i mean he's a strong runner so you don't want to lose that out of him but he he's also kind of sneaky versatile because he, yeah. he was good in the passing game <clears throat> last year for the gamblers so I mean, if he's picked up some speed with that, but kept that muscle to be able to get those hard runs, then that's that's a scary thought to have him running on your defense. 
Hopefully we get to see it. I really want to. Yeah, I I mean I want to see him play too. I mean he he's a when when he plays, I mean that, that offense is completely different. He's one of the he's one of the top running backs in this league. So the league, especially not having Abram Smith, it's important to to have your top players out there. So they definitely need Mark Thompson to play. Yes, sir. Agreed, agreed. Anthony, that about wraps it up, man. We made it before two hours hit. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, we're at hour hour fifty two. Look at that. We yeah. got eight minutes to spare. Nice job. <laughs> I appreciate you coming on tonight, man. And I didn't know, did you have plans to go to a game this weekend? Um, I was originally going to go, but um, I'm going to, I have to stay home, <clears throat> stay home this weekend because my wife has to get, um, go out of town this weekend. So I unfortunately will not be able to go to the Houston game, but obviously I will be covering it from home and taking care of it that way. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can do the same adequate work there that you do there in person. There's just something about that energy that that makes it different in person. You know, the, uh, the feelings. It's a it's it's a whole nother vibe. But yeah, uh, hopefully we'll get to meet up at a game this season, man. It'll be awesome. Yeah, um, I think I put in credentials for other um, Houston games, so I'm hoping to. I, I was trying to get out to San, San Antonio last week for the Battle Hawks, but I didn't get approved for that. So we'll we'll, we'll see. Um, I know that's a different process, so um, hopefully I can get out to Houston at least one time this year for a game. It, it's been tough this year compared to last year. Speaking on 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 that, I just the, the the last year was much easier in getting that approval than what it is this year. So I understand. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. But Anthony, man, great talking to you. Check out Anthony's work, guys. I've had it rolling at the bottom of the screen. Let me pop it up again. It'll be in the show notes as well. Uh, Anthony, do you want to plug yourself or anything before you roll out, man? Um, you can follow me on Twitter at by Anthony Miller. I post all my work there as well as the work we're doing on a uh, <clears throat> Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. Um, if you want to check out the current work we're doing, we are currently not on Sports Illustrated. We're technically posting our articles on Athlon Sports right now, just because of the whole, there's a weird transition going on with Sports Illustrated, but we're going to be back on Sports Illustrated soon enough. So if you want to check out our work, just um, look up Fan Nation, Athlon Sports, uh, UFL or CFL. We're posting all of our articles on there and we'll let you guys know when we're officially back on to Sports Illustrated. But, um, you know, make sure to check out my work. Um, if you want to follow Mike Mitchell, that's at by M Mike Mitchell. He's putting up some great work as well. So if uh, you want to, Check out our CFL or UFL coverage. That's where you'll be. Just uh, make sure to follow us and make sure to uh, check out the work we're doing. Yes, sir. We will. And I'll make sure to update. I'll put another link in for the for what the Athlon. I'll find it and get it all set up. So, guys, about three hours after this, two hours, I'll have everything up <laughs> on the show notes and everywhere. So you can click links and go straight to him and find his work, as well as like Mike Mitchell and the other great people they have writing. Uh I appreciate you greatly, Anthony, man. And it's always a pleasure getting on and having a conversation with you and, and any of the other guys that you guys are the staples of this spring football media. So appreciate you greatly, dude. Keep doing good work. No, I mean, you're, you're doing Matt, the work you, you're doing and with, with the alternative sport uh, football network. I mean, it, it's something that alternative sports leagues really need is more networks like yours. So keep up the great work and, uh, Hopefully next time I'm on here, we can talk positively about the Renegades. And <laughs> I hope so. That, that would be nice. Championship game again, man. <laughs> that, Hopefully. <be> great. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> We're definitely going to get you on if that happens. No worries. I will definitely contact you. Uh, oh, I, will, I will be in St. Uh, hopefully I'll be in St. Louis regardless of if Arlington will be there. But it'd be a lot nicer if they would. Yes, sir. Agreed. Agreed. Take it easy, Anthony. Thank you again. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right. Appreciate him again for coming on. Always great to talk with an expert spring football analyst, writer, uh, contributor, whatever you want to call him. I mean, he, he's got a lot of information regarding alternative sports, not only spring football. Check out some of his work. Uh, I would follow him on Twitter. Probably that's your best bet. Uh, that's about it for me, guys. It's been fun Tuesday getting out of here before two hours hit. So the goal has been met. <clears throat> We'll be back next Tuesday. Not sure the guest yet. Not. We'll, we'll see what happens. I'll definitely let you know on social media a day or two prior to the show. Regardless, we'll break down the games, have a discussion, and kind of interact with some comments and questions. So, 
appreciate you listening. If you listen for the whole thing, I appreciate the support. If you've been supporting us on the back end, especially, especially those from the, the very get go, uh, it's been a long fun journey and just getting started. So we're going to keep on keeping on and doing our thing. Uh, appreciate the guys uh, for coming on today. The contributors, they always do a good job. I'll have their stuff in the notes. Click and go. You can check them out and, and interact with these guys. You're welcome to talk to them and message them. And, and they're, they're good people, I promise. So check that out. Uh, thank you to UFL Board and the UFL. I appreciate you both greatly. UFL, I appreciate you letting me cover the league. And UFL Board, I appreciate everything you've done since the get-go, getting me going on this whole thing. And still now, we partner up. We share content. We do some good work. So appreciate you, Mark and ufl board thank you <clears throat> guys i'm excited we're coming on week four we're rolling on along just cruising hopefully we keep getting some good games and and you know i i don't want to see a team just totally dominate the league all year but it is nice to see a team clicking and rolling like the stallions are right now so keep doing your thing stallions we're watching uh da, da, da. i think that's it Guys, if you need anything from me, reach out anytime. I will try to respond, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever. Our Instagram's kind of lame. We don't have too much going on there in terms of followers, but Facebook and X get pretty pretty good sometimes. So check those out. Give us a like and a follow. It's always appreciated. And yeah, that, that's kind of how we do it. So appreciate it again for watching, guys. It's always fun. It's always real. My name is Matthew Tyler. And until next time. Hope you have a good night. Peace out. Go high. A go home. Go high. Go high. A go home. Go high. Go high. A go home. Go high. Go high. A go home. Touch down like a hands on. When the circle turn to my home. Can't get me out of my zone. Go high.